Welcome back to the second video in the sixth lecture on COVIDonomics. Last lecture, we saw this tendency worldwide for the reproduction, the effective reproduction number for COVID-19 to go to one. In this video and in the next video, we're going to try and explain that and the implications of it. The work that I'm going to draw on is pretty much at the frontier. There's a lot of economists working on these sort of models, trying to bring economic behaviour into the epidemiological models. The one I'm going to use is one by Joshua Gans, friend and colleague who's at the University of Toronto. He uses a, a shortcut. I'll make that shortcut clear but it does simplify the approach significantly and means that we can present it quite simply in this first-year economics video. The formal working paper that I'm drawing on is this NBER working paper from uh, July of this year. Um, if you want a simpler explanation, Joshua's also got uh, a short post on it. The link is, unfortunately, this pretty horrible thing here. But if you want to uh, get access to this simplified uh, uh, description of the model, then the best way is just to go to Joshua's website, uh, joshuadangans.com, uh, and it's part of Joshua's newsletter. So just subscribe to his newsletter and look for this particular article. Just a word of warning before we get started. I'm going to be using a slightly simplified version of Joshua's simplified model. Um, so my maths isn't going to quite line up with uh, what Joshua's done. But again, what you should get out of this is the importance of including ep economic behaviour in these epidemiological models uh, and the importance for both predictions about the virus and about policy implications. That's what we're really trying to draw from here because we are at the frontier and it's an area of work that's developing. In this video, we're going to start working through a simple model of behavioural choice to try and bring the economics, the epidemiology together. And we're going to see that that partially but not fully explains this stylized empirical fact that the reproduction number, the effective reproduction number, tends to go to one. As our starting point, we're going to look at how an individual will choose their level of social activity, which I'll, I'll just denote by capital A, how they choose that in the face of a pandemic. And it's going to be a pretty simple model. The first part of this model is that increasing social activity today is something we enjoy. So we like interacting with other people. We like going out to bars, to restaurants, to cinemas, to concerts, and so on. So if there wasn't a pandemic, we would have an optimal level of social activity that we'd engage in. But the pandemic raises the costs of those, that social activity. So the second element is simply going to be that increasing social activity raises the probability that we catch the virus. And that's going to lead to a loss in the future. In other words, we prefer to stay well tomorrow rather than catch COVID-19 and be sick. Just to use a simple example to capture this idea, suppose that you know, one unit of social activity means that we randomly bump into one person. So if that person's infected, then they pass it on to us, we get COVID-19. Otherwise, we don't get infected from that unit of social activity. This simple example can be captured by the little bit of maths we have down here. So just a reminder from the second set of videos that we had. Remember, I is the number of infected people in the population, so they're the people that can make other people sick, that can pass the virus on. N is the total population size. So the probability P, that you become sick or get infected this period, will depend on the amount of social interaction that you do. Remember, every time you undertake a unit of social activity, you bump into one person, the probability that that person is infected is simply I, the number of infected people, divided by the total population. So the probability that you become infected is I divided by N times the amount of social activity you engage in. So what does this mean? Well, for an individual in a pandemic, uh, 
they like engaging in social activity. It's something they enjoy doing. But because it increases the risk of catching the virus, that's going to moderate their level of social activity. And notice that that risk increases with the number of infected people as a proportion of the population. So as the number of infected people in our society rises, you're going to tend to have a bigger cost of social activity. Each unit of social activity has a bigger effect on the probability of you becoming infected and having that loss due to being infected. So if you've got a trade-off here. We like social activity, but the more social activity we do, the more risk we face, and that risk depends on this I divided by N. So let's try and capture that in a simple graph. On the vertical axis, we're going to have the quantity of social activity, capital A. And on the horizontal axis, we're going to have the proportion of infected people in the population, I divided by N. And that trade-off between liking social activity, but social activity creating a risk of being infected, is going to be reflected in this downward sloping curve here, our social activity choice curve, I'm going to call it. How do we interpret this? Well, if I divided by N is very small, if there's only a few infected people in the population, the risk of social activity is low. So we'd expect you to choose a fairly high level of social activity, possibly close to what you would choose even if there was no virus. However, if there's a very large number of infected people in the population, so I on N is high, then social activity becomes very risky. And so you're going to choose a lower level of that social activity. You still get pleasure from it, but now the risk is too great. You're going to cut it back. And you'd expect this simple downward sloping line that we've got here, where as I divided by N increases, then the level of social activity continually decreases. And that's actually given by our simple example that we've presented here. If you want more detail on the maths of this, I'll put a little bit up just in the last video of this series. The second input that we need for our model comes from the SIR modeling that we looked at in the second set of videos. And it's this equation here, which tells us how infections change over time. Just to remind you how this works, if we have a certain number of people infected at a time t, then those people randomly interact with other people. And remember, beta was our number of people that you interact with. That's a way of simply looking at it. Um, that you can think of beta as being, for example, that an infected person bumps into three other people. And if they bump into somebody that is susceptible to the virus, they then infect them. So, so that was our easy way of thinking about this. Um, and this is just the probability that when they bump into somebody that that person is susceptible. It's just given by the number of susceptible people divided by the total population. So this first part of the equation just tells us how many people the infected people in period T will bump into and will infect in the next period. Of course, some of the infected people get well, and that's just a fraction gamma. So the change in the infected people is the new infected people minus the infected people who have recovered. The change to this equation that we want to do to bring in the economics is that now the number of people an infected person bumps into is going to depend on the level of social activity that's occurring. Or in other words, this beta term here will now depend on our level of social activity, that capital A. So in other words, to bring in the economics, we want beta to be a function of social activity, A, and the way that's sensibly going to work is the higher the level of social activity, the more likely an infected person is going to bump into and infect other people. So we'd expect this beta to be increasing in the level of social activity. Now, a little bit of mathematics. So from our basic change of infection model here, notice that I 
t occurs twice, so we can take that outside. So we end up with i t times the stuff in the brackets. And suppose we're interested in the situation where the change in the number of infected people is zero. So the number of infected people stays constant, or i divided by n then must stay constant because you've got a fixed population. If the number of infected people are constant, then i divided by n will also be constant. Well, if we set delta i equal to zero, that means either i t is going to be equal to zero, which is pretty boring, there is no infection, or this stuff in the brackets has to be equal to zero. And that's what we've got down here. So beta times number of susceptible divided by the population minus gamma equals zero. But remember, we've said that beta is an increasing function of the level of social activity. So that means for any given fraction of susceptible people in the population, for any s over n, there will be a unique level of social activity such that the change in the number of infected people is zero or the change in i over n is equal to zero. So let's just call that level of social activity, let's call that A star. And we can simply draw that A star on our diagram here. So this horizontal line is going to be our delta i on n equals zero line, or the situation, the level of social activity, so that the number of infected people doesn't change over time. So why does this matter? Well, suppose you start down here at a low level of i on n. Well, at that level of infected people as a proportion of a population, individuals will choose a level of activity up here. Let me just call that a prime. Notice that that a prime is going to be greater than a star. But remember, if the activity level is greater than a star, that means beta is going to be higher, and that means that the number of infected people is going to be increasing in the population. So our delta i is going to be positive. So in that situation, we would expect i to be increasing. So we're going to move to a higher value of i on n. So in other words, if we start off to the left here, the choice of social activity is going to start pushing us to the right. Alternatively, let's start off with a higher level of i divided by n. Well, given that level of i divided by n, individuals will choose an activity level given by their social activity choice curve. So let's have that back here at a double prime. Notice that that's less than a star. So we're going to be in this region where beta's low and the number of infected people is going to be falling. So delta i on n is less than zero. But that means that we're going to start shifting over time leftwards on the horizontal axis. i as a proportion of n will fall because the number of infected people is actually dropping. So what our simple model here shows is that if we start off with a low level of infected people, we're going to tend to have an increase in the number of infections. If we start off with a high level of infected people, we're going to end up having a decrease in the number of infected people. And where we're going to end up is going to be at this point here, where the social activity level chosen by people is exactly this A star, which leads to a beta such that there's neither an increase nor a decrease in the number of infected people. So in other words, we can think of this as being our equilibrium outcome. Just a word of caution here, remember that we got here by taking S over N as being fixed, and that's a shortcut. We know that actually S is going to change over time. Joshua calls this his uh, shortcut to be able to simplify the model down. We're going to come back to that l later on uh, in the next video. But for the moment, 
let's just leave it and consider our equilibrium. So I've drawn the equilibrium on this graph here. We predict that no matter where we start off in terms of the level of infections, once people start responding endogenously to the virus, once they start choosing their level of social activity, taking the virus into account, that we're going to move towards a level of social activity of A star, which is associated with a fixed number I on N. But a fixed number I on N means that delta I is going to be equal to zero, or in other words, our number of infected stay the same over time. Our effective reproduction rate, or our effective reproduction number, is one. So this actually lines up with the empirical stylized fact that we've noted from different countries, from different states around the world. And this is a really important and powerful use of the economics. Because this suggests that the endogenous behaviour that isn't captured by standard epidemiological models, the economic behaviour, is not only important, but it's critical to making empirical projections about how the virus will spread. It's also critical for making policy decisions. And that's what we're going to get to in the next video.